So before we get on to the to the pathways, we want to take a short uh, diversion into dopamine. And dopamine is a very important uh, part of, of the uh, basal ganglia, the normal basal ganglia operation. I've just, uh, uh, I've got here a section. Um, this is a oddly coronal section, which shows you the cerebral cortex. Here's the corpus callosum. Here are the lateral ventricles. Uh, here's, the, actually, this is, looks, this is the foramen of Monroe coming into the uh, third, uh, to the um, third ventricle, and here's the, the end of the third ventricle. You can see the internal capsule coming into the cerebral peduncles, and here's the pons. This is an obliquely cut. So s internal capsule, cerebral peduncles, pons, and then this dark stuff right here is a substantia nigra. There's a substantia nigra on either, on either side. The substantia nigra, this is the substantia nigra pars compacta, as opposed to the substantia nigra pars reticulata. Substantia nigra pars reticulata, these are neurons that are output cells from the basal ganglia. They do not contain uh, dopamine. Substantia nigra pars compacta cells contain dopamine, and they project into the striatum. They also contain this black stuff, which is neuromelanin. Now, in between these two uh, areas where, uh, of substantia nigra pars compacta is an area right here, which is called the ventral tegmental area. And these neurons also have dopamine, although they do not have neuromelanin. So right in here it is VTA, or ventral tegmental area. These neurons have dopamine. They also project to the striatum, but to a specific part of the striatum the ventral striatum, that's, that's, um, uh, which is also called uh, the accumbens, which is up in the, in the forward part of, of the striatum. So the VTA is important uh, for, for providing dopamine into the ventral striatum, the nucleus accumbens, whereas the substantia nigra pars compacta provides it to the rest of the striatum. Now, what does, what does dopamine do? Well, there are two different, uh, broadly speaking, there are two different types, uh, ways in which dopamine cells fire. They either fire tonically, well, they fire tonically, and they can also fire phasically. So let's start with the tonic. The tonic, uh, I would suggest that you think about the tonic firing of dopamine cells, which provides a tonic release of dopamine within the striatum as, think of that as motor oil. Why do I say that? Let's go over to the board. And when we, we have, um, there have been mice engineered that have no dopamine. These mice don't move and within a day or two, if they're not supported, they will die. So at one end, there is no uh, dopamine. The concentration of dopamine is zero, and there's no movement. As you increase the level of dopamine, you get more and more movement. I don't, I don't know that this is a linear relationship, but it's something in that vicinity that it keeps on going up. And so the normal amount of movement might be somewhere in this area where you have enough movement, but then how do you get, what happens up here? Well, this is, let's imagine that a person takes an amphetamine drug, which has the effect of releasing more dopamine, and you go back to the neural signaling uh, lectures to, to remind yourself of how that, how that happens. And in that situation, there's more movement. The person appears to be always in, in constant motion, very jumpy. And so this is the reason why um, you're, you're seeing this curve in action. When you see a person on amphetamine, on some version of speed, you're seeing this curve in action. Now, I said that there's no movement, but that's a little bit of an overstatement because, in fact, these mice that are born without any dopamine, they breathe. So what does that mean? Well, it means that 
there's no movement that is regulated by the basal ganglia, okay? There are some movements. So some movements don't need the basal ganglia. They just happen, and one of those movements is breathing. Breathing depends on a central pattern generator in the medulla, okay? So if that's intact, there's going to be breathing. It doesn't depend on the, on the basal ganglia. Um, there, are some, there are certain um, movements that depend on the cerebellum uh, and, and brainstem and spinal cord, but not on the basal ganglia. So, for example, a person who cannot move, who is akinetic, and we'll get back to that phrase in a moment, but who is not moving because they have, let's say, Parkinson's, if you toss them a ball, their reflex... They do reflexively, they automatically go up and catch that ball. That's a movement, but it is not a basal ganglia supported movement. So, what dopamine is absolutely necessary for is are these are these um, basal ganglia supported movements. Getting up to go to the refrigerator to get something to eat. That's a basal ganglia supported movement. Okay, so in the absence of dopamine, there is no motor oil. There's just no, uh, the movement can't happen. It either can't happen or it's very unlikely to happen. So if there's a complete lack of movement, that person is called akinetic. And if there is a, um, a lack of movement, not complete, it's a hypokinetic. It's a hypokinetic condition. Now, another reason that you can get excess movement occurs because of an iatrogenic condition called tardive, dyskine tardive dyskinesia. So tardive dyskinesia can happen um, in people uh, that are treated with psychotropic drugs, dopamine receptor antagonists. So this can of often be people that are receiving this uh, for, say, treatment of schizophrenia. And over time, those drugs uh, be, these antagonists lead to a uh, receptor supersensitivity. Supersensitivity. So now there's still dopamine around, and now the receptors are supersensitive, and so you get excess movement. And the tardive dyskinesia is a is um, uh, it, it's these constant small movements, oftentimes of the face, so ongoing movements that are not controllable. This is a, is a reaction to this re receptor supersensitivity that is a, is a uh, caused by the drug, okay? The long-term, the chronic in, uh, administration of these antagonists. And that's, that's a, really, it's a really big problem in treating uh, neuropsychiatric disorders and in avoiding uh, th this very serious um, uh, iatrogenic effect. I said that there were two ways that these dopamine uh, can be released. One is tonically, and, and I, what I'm suggesting is that you think about that as, a, uh, as, a, um, as motor oil. But the other way to, the, that it's released is phasically. And when it's released phasically, it is, it is um, very helpful in supporting, facilitating a movement right at that moment. In, the, in this situation, what we're going to come back to is that in a situation where there is excess dopamine, one can get a uh, facilitation of actions that are called punding. Okay, these are actions, small little actions, like picking hair over and over again, or, or um, continually uh, washing one's hands over and over again or organizing the the toothpicks in into piles over and over again these kind of over repetitive movements um, are are highly uh, they're much more likely to happen in an environment of excess dopamine excess phasic dopamine <laughs>